If you're a beginner, there's actually just one critical skill you need to master to create good motion design, and that's the transform properties in After Effects. So in this video, we're going to break down what you need to know in order to master them and become the motion designer of your dreams. If you're new to After Effects, you may be a bit overwhelmed with all the different options. I know I was. There are different types of layers, all these effects, and then thousands of plugins that can create animations for you. When I started animating in After Effects, I was constantly getting shiny object syndrome, trying out the latest plugin or some particle emitter effect I didn't really understand to try and make animation easy. And what I realized over the years is that a lot of that was a waste of time and I would have improved a lot faster if I just focused on the fundamentals. In reality, you can't cover a bad animation with effects, styles or plugins, and all good animation in After Effects starts with the transform properties. You can access your transform properties for almost any layer in After Effects by twirling down your layer to transform and you can see all of the properties available to animate. However, we're going to focus on shape layers because they are generally used the most. So let's make a shape layer like this. And you'll see we can twirl down our transform properties. But if you also twirl down our internal shape like this, you'll see you also have another set of transform properties. And this is worth noting because this used to confuse the shit out of me when I first started. Generally speaking, you want to keyframe your main animation on the external transform properties, and you can add extra secondary animation to your internal properties if you need to, but it's not very common to do so. Now, to create any animation, you will mostly use the position, scale, and rotation properties. And in reality, with these three properties, you can create almost anything. But each one has its own quirks, so let's talk about them individually, and I'll show you some tricks and pitfalls when using them. Let's start with position. So back to our circle with our external transform properties accessible, we can click this stopwatch icon to add a keyframe. Let's move our object over to the left and then moving forward in the timeline, let's move our object over to the right to create another keyframe. This is the most basic use of the position transform property, but let's build on this knowledge. Now let's go up and click and hold our pen tool and select the convert vertex tool. Now if we click and drag on our bezier anchor point, we can pull out a bezier handle and create a curve for our shape to follow. We've now created what's known as an arc, which is one of the principles of animation. Using arcs already puts you ahead of most people, but there's a problem you can run into with this technique. This used to irritate the heck out of me and I had no idea how to fix it. So to show you, we're going to add another bezier handle to our second keyframe. Now let's say we wanted our circle to stop for a bit at its second position before moving back to the left again. To do that, we can copy and paste this keyframe ahead in the timeline and then going forward, we can move our object to the left to drop in another keyframe. You can probably already see some wonky stuff going on with these arcs that's going to cause some problems. But from the looks of things, we could just break the anchor point for the second part of the animation by grabbing the convert vertex tool again and clicking and dragging on the handle. And this does fix our arc, but look at what happens when we play this animation. What the frick is that wobble happening when our circle is supposed to be still? After Effects has automatically created new Bezier handles, so if we move this handle around, you'll get a sense of why we're getting this wobble. To fix this, you can remove all the Bezier handles from that keyframe by simply clicking on the keyframe with your Convert Vertex tool. But you will lose your arc on both sides. So alternatively, you can right click and click Toggle Hold Keyframe to just remove the handle on the right. And now we get what we're after. Now let's remove those keyframes because I want to show you another way to use position. If you right click on position and select separate dimensions, you'll see that X and Y are now separated. And you may be wondering why you'd want to do that. Well, it usually comes down to easing and the graph editor, which is a bit beyond the scope of this video, but to cover it briefly, when you don't separate your dimensions, you can easily create arcs like we just did. But if you add easing like this, and go into the graph editor, you can only change the influence in the speed graph using these handles. And as you can see in the value graph, when I select the keyframes, I can't change the influence. And I've just realized I've opened up a can of worms because now you're gonna ask, well, who cares? Why not just use the speed graph? And yes, you can just use the speed graph, but the value graph can sometimes be a bit more intuitive and often you can get a smoother, more complex result with the value graph. So, when it comes to position, if you're only animating your object in one dimension, up or down, or left or right, you might as well separate your dimensions to have more control. There are other cool things you can do when they're separated as well. For example, we could separate the dimensions and then animate the circle to move up and down on the Y position. 
Now let's just copy and paste this a bunch of times to repeat this action and if we drop a keyframe at the start on the X position and move the shape off screen and then go to the end of the animation and move the shape to the other side of the screen, look at what happens. There's a triangle path the object is going to follow and if we easy ease all the Y keyframes with F9, we smooth out the path and look at the result. Pretty nice, right? And just imagine how annoying and time consuming that would have been to create without separating your dimensions. This is also a way to create a bouncing ball animation really easily. You know what, as a little gift, why don't I show you that? I'll do my best to be brief, but I don't want to lose you in the process, so I need you to promise to keep watching in return. We have a deal, you just need to hit that like button to say yes. So here is a quick timing chart for a bouncing ball. This will change according to the material and the type of ball, but this is just a guide to get started. So let's plot out the keyframes where the ball is on the ground on our Y position property. So according to the timing chart, we have a 20 frame gap, then a 10 frame gap, then a 13 frame gap, and then another 10 frame gap. And now we have a keyframe at each down position. Now let's create the first up keyframe. So we're gonna move the keyframes over about 10 frames and move the ball up at the start to create a new keyframe. At this point, it's helpful to create layer markers for each down keyframe as a reference. And now we're just going to add up keyframes between each down keyframe by moving the ball into the correct position and reducing the height of the circle with each keyframe going forward. Now if we add an X position keyframe at the start and move a couple frames past the end and move the ball over, you can see our graph starting to appear. To correct the arcs, we can go into the graph editor and make sure we're using the value graph. Now with our convert vertex tool again, we can just create nice curves on all our up keyframes like this. And this is what we get. Now after a few more tweaks to the timing and easing, we have a decent ball bounce. Now onto rotation. The first thing you need to know is that your object will always rotate around your anchor point, which you can change by clicking on the pan behind or anchor point tool and then moving the anchor point to wherever you like. And then when we rotate, it rotates around that point. Now for the internal rotation, you have the same options, so don't get confused between the two. You can see that we can also change the internal anchor point and animate the internal rotation around that point. But remember, start your animation on the external rotation and only use the internal if it's really necessary. The next thing you need to know is that when animating the rotation, using the value graph is often the best and I'll show you why. Let's create a quick animation and add an easy ease with F9. Now in the value graph editor, if I adjust the handles on each side so that the graph goes below the keyframe on the first one and above the keyframe on the second, You'll see that we've added some quick anticipation and settle, making for a subtle but more dynamic animation. And with multiple rotation keyframes, you have a lot more control over the easing this way. Finally, we're going to look at scale. And just like rotation, the scale property is of course sensitive to the location of the anchor point. So as you can see, it will scale up or down based on the anchor point. This can be very helpful for animation. It is also possible to break the link between the X and the Y scale by clicking this link icon. The most obvious use case for this is if you wanted to animate on a square or rectangle. So here is a square and if we change our anchor point at the bottom like this and then drop in a scale keyframe and unlink the X and Y, we can now move forward and drop another keyframe before changing the first keyframe to zero on just the Y axis. Then with a bit of easing on the right keyframe, you should start to see how this could be useful. Now if you use this information to keep practicing, you'll be well on your way to mastering this critical skill. And as you may have noticed, easing in the graph editor goes hand in hand with the skill. So go ahead and check out my tutorial on easing next to level up further. And of course, hit subscribe to gain more motion XP.